All right, and with that, uh, I will call to order the uh, uh, meeting of the four commissioners of the State Board of Elections, who are all present and on the call. Um, our first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes for March 15th. Is there a motion? I move to adopt the minutes. Second. Second. I have a question. I have a question about the minutes, if I could. Um, in, in, under new business in our minutes, there's a reference to a brief discussion on a regulation for high density early voting sites. Um, that terminology, I'm just trying to understand where that came from. And my understanding was what we discussed was the statute that requires the largest municipality in a county to have an early voting site. And that to me is a different thing than a high density early voting site. So I'm just trying to understand how that term got inserted. Is, is that the way the statute refers to that or how did that come about? I just feel those are two different concepts. Your biggest municipality may not be the most high density area in, you know, that's all. So I'm just trying to- Commissioner, sure you want to propose a, uh, a revision? Well, it seems like that, you know, we, uh, as I understand that term, it was the, it was the most populous municipality early voting site. That was the issue that we were, yeah. I think, looking at for regulations. Was so, that, was that correct? It is, it's a population. I think they've just put in the word density for population, but, but you're correct in your interpretation. It's based on the change in law that would require her at least one early voting site in the jurisdiction in the county that has the, the largest population. Yeah, I, I just think that's a different concept than high density. So I just, <laughs> I, I just thought that term was misleading in our minutes. I don't, I don't have any problem revising that, but we should have uh, either explicit text or we'll have to hold this over for the next meeting. Can we just hold it over? I think be easier to mind, and then we'll just if somebody could just put in the. Whatever the statutory term is, it'd be unless somebody knows it offhand, which is okay with me too. All right, that's fine. Then we'll uh, put this over for the next meeting. Okay. Um, uh, with that, we'll uh, then start with our unit updates, and we'll start with our co-executive directors, Todd Ballantyne and Bob Brown. Hello, commissioners. This is uh, Bob Brown. Um, I wanted to cover, I guess, in the order of importance, the budget is now done. There were no line item vetoes or, um, that impact on um, election administration um, from the budget that uh, was initially proposed by the governor to the budget that was adopted by the legislature. There were a few changes with regard to the state board and county boards, um, the state board received a total uh, separate from the earlier meeting that we had for public uh, campaign finance. Uh, for the rest of the agency, there's a total appropriation of a little over $8.1 million, excluding enforcement um, to run the agency. Uh, that represents a $1 million increase in personal services for the state board uh, from what was originally proposed. Um, there is also an, a couple of uh, other areas of the budget. The aid to localities budget provided an additional $2 million grant for county boards of elections uh, to assist uh, them in the uh, expenses related to the expansion of early voting. And there was in the capital budget uh, an appropriation of 25 million, 20, uh, 20 million of that uh, was uh, dedicated towards county boards of election for uh, a host of um, eligible expenses uh, to upgrade equipment, et cetera. And uh, 5 million of that fund was made available to the state board to uh, likewise make uh, improvements to systems. So that's a, a, a bit good news. Um, the second on my list is we have, uh, the state board has been working through the pandemic um, with the Office of State Controller. They had identified last year, just before the pandemic began, 
uh, an audit of the 2018 uh, federal cybersecurity funds. And we just completed that audit um, in February of this year, um, receiving a preliminary report from the Office of the State Controller on April 14th. And uh, Todd and I responded to the uh, request for comments on April 20th. Um, the, the report is still preliminary, so the Comptroller's Office has asked us not to release the specifics of the report um, until it gets into its final stage because it might be modified to some extent. But I think generally um, I can say it was a very positive report and we look forward to sharing the uh, public findings. Um, I think we talked a little bit about space planning at our earlier meeting. While we have not made great uh, strides in our, uh, you know, resolving the matter, uh, small steps are good and we got to start somewhere. So we've continued to have conversations with the executive chamber and Office of General Services. Um, Todd and I have a follow-up meeting with OGS scheduled for Monday, April 26th to go over the plan that they submitted and to identify, you know, where it falls short of, um, you know, the actual programmatic needs, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, just the, fact, the easiest to describe besides the fact that the number of spaces is wrong, um, they just basically provided 134 spots that were six by six and it didn't matter if you were the intake clerk or the program director, you got six by six, things like that that we need to address anyway. So, so that I thought was a good sign that that is moving forward. Um, with regard to these two new, the, the new programs, we'll, we will need to set forward, and I think we'll probably cover it um, in the PIO section, but we will have to do additional grant programs to be able to share the 2 million aid to localities with the counties and the 20 million capital budget with the counties. So now that those funds uh, survive the budget, uh, we can we can turn next to getting those contracts ready. And usually we bring those sums to you for consideration once we come up with that plan. Neither of them, neither of the grants require an approval of a plan at outside of this building. Um, you know, that we remember in 2019, that was a requirement of the funds needed the approval of the division of budget. The aid to locality this year only requires the state board to come up with a plan and, and make it available to the division of budget and the Senate and the assembly fiscal committee. So we will, uh, hopefully that will expedite it. Um, I think that's my general list that I have. Todd, do you have others? Uh, I'll only add on uh, two things. One on the audit, uh, that was a, a, I was correct, that was a preliminary report uh, the next phase in, in a controller's audit normally is a draft report in which we would be able to put a formal response to, and there's a normally have 30 days to respond to that. Uh, but again, it was uh, overall a positive report. Um, and with regards to the grants, we'll obviously, you know, the counties are familiar with the grant process. So, um, you know, I think they'll be appreciative of the funds that they give you and, you know, what we will, once we've established that, obviously we will continue as we've always done with the counties, is to, to uh, package up once we've approved the plan and started to put it together, we'll put together a webinar for them so that we can explain to them, you know, how to access the resources. And uh, we actually, um, we have a, re we continue our regularly scheduled calls with them, our next one, uh, because of this board meeting got pushed to next week. And of course, they're also dealing with ballot access issues. So um, we'll certainly update them as we go forward with that. Any questions? All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, next we'll turn to the council's report. Uh, we're sorry to hear about uh, Kim's problems, but uh, we'll have uh, Brian give the report. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. 
Um, just to give a little update on um, significant status changes in um, some litigation and then a report on <clears throat> litigation that's pending um, uh, that, uh, or, or rather that commenced um, prior to the, uh, to the last meeting. Um, the, the board made a motion for summary judgment on April 9th and the uh, consolidated motion for summary judgment actually in the Sam Green Libertarian um, cases um, and on the heels of the very favorable um, uh, rulings that we got at the trial level on the PI and then the Second Circuit decision um, that um, that process is now unfolding um, and hopefully will cause the case to, um, to come to an end. Um, since the, um, the last uh, meeting, <clears throat> there were uh, four suits commenced um, against the board. Um, three of them, two of them actually, were voluntarily discontinued. Um, one of them was dismissed um, this morning, um, leaving um, one pending, uh, which is uh, a case in Western New York, uh, Niagara County Supreme Court, uh, Ross versus New York State Board of Elections, uh, dealing with the um, constitutionality of, um, of uh, provisions of the of the election law that allow for um, uh, uh, absentee ballots by reason of um, illness or a reason of concern um, given the um, uh, the pandemic, um, and the answer in that case is due on May 21, and it is proceeding. Um, we um, obviously in the council office we're very busy with uh, ballot access. Uh, uh, questions and petition questions, um, objection questions, both from the board and many members of the public. Um, and, in, and so we spent a good deal of time on that. Um, also, the um, uh, training unit um, has, um, just to give a little report, uh, trained more than 1,100 people um, in the, uh, the use of the campaign uh, software to date. There are, I believe, um, uh, an additional uh, significant number of trainings scheduled uh, on our website for, for just the, um, the, the software uh, that people can still register for. Um, and in addition, there are uh, 12 uh, training sessions scheduled for campaign finance updates. Uh, the next one is on April um, 29. Um, these trainings are three hours long. Uh, people can register from them. They're obviously they're all being held virtually. Um, the trainings are sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, and sometimes in the evening after um, business hours. Try to accommodate getting as many people able to uh, receive those trainings as possible. All of the trainings qualify for um, uh, certified public accountant continuing education credits, and five of them qualify for um, CLE. The uh, compliance unit is at uh, 146,941 reports reviewed, uh, which is um, significant. We're coming up on 150,000 uh, reports reviewed since the inception of the unit. Um, we have uh, the compliance unit is preparing um, a deficiency referral. There are about 450 um, uh, preliminary deficiencies that they're working through right now. Um, I am advised. Um, by our staff that um, for the uh, January periodic the number of uh, non-filers um, is, give or take, um, 3,015. Uh, we have um, posted um, 233 paid internet digital advertisements um, as of this morning, That's the current number. And um, I think for me, that pretty much sums it up, unless there are any questions. All right, if there are no questions, we'll uh, move to uh, the report for election operations, Tom Connolly and Brendan Luvolo. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, as uh, Brian just alluded to, we recently went through a uh, ballot access period uh, where we were also supporting the county board. Uh, we, in addition to that, we received a number of petitions here at the state board for judicial delegate alternate. Uh, we prepared the ballot access ruling recommendations for the commissioner's consideration under new business later in the meeting so that we can finalize the certification for the primary and get that out to the county board. Uh, we also collected the local final.
filing information from county boards with regard to any petition for delegate, alternate, or state committee, which were filed locally so that we can prepare the roll call in the committee list after the primary. Uh, with regard to those two processes, uh, it was our first official foray into using the new CAPA system. Uh, we've been working with IT on any issues which have arisen uh, and any needed changes for functionality in the future. A uh, quick update on Oneida County. Um, there are now both new uh, Democratic and Republican commissioners in place at the board. Uh, we have been supporting them as they kind of get their foot in, and we anticipate having going out again for another in-person visit to further provide whatever support guidance uh, they need. Uh, we are continuing our conversation with various voting system vendors uh, who are considering uh, new system submissions or modifications uh, sometime this year. Again, that includes Democracy Live for their BMD, uh, ballot marking device, clear ballot for their precinct voting system, uh, Heart InterCivic for their uh, precinct voting system, and also uh, new systems from Dominion. Uh, we also are continuing to have our conversations with the ESNS as they seek to address the discrepancies uh, that were enumerated during the testing of the Express Vote XL. Uh, we have tested the new configuration submitted by all three e electronic poll book vendors. We have provided the commissioners with those testing reports, and these configurations are on the agenda for your consideration later in the meeting. Uh, we continue to work with NICE Tech and IT to formalize and document the process by which a new voter registration vendor may be approved for use by a county board. Uh, in addition, a number of counties are expecting delivery of some new machines, and therefore operations staff will be heading out to those counties to perform acceptance testing. Uh, we have sent out reminders to and collecting information from counties on the testing and maintenance data required for any machine that was used in any village election conducted by the county board. Uh, we've done the same for all required electronic public network security surveys, early voting security plans, and procedures to prevent public release of election results, with the first two of those being due to the state board no less than 60 days before the primary, which is tomorrow. With regard to ranked choice voting, uh, the certification review continues on the universal tabulator utility that was submitted by New York City to be used uh, at the June primary. Uh, the source code and functional testing has been completed. Uh, from that testing, there were some issues which arose, such as uh, the submitted hardware configuration not being able to handle more than 1.1 million cast vote records. Um, obviously, New York uh, would probably need a much bigger uh, support number. So uh, we were able to work with our testing partners to figure out what hardware configuration changes were necessary so that the utility could handle more than 6 million records at a time, uh, given that the, the February enrollment for New York City is just under 5.6 million. Uh, in addition, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, uh, who developed the utility, is working on revised and also additional documentation to address other outstanding documentary deficiencies, uh, which will be reviewed by SLI and NYSEC as we receive them. Uh, we're targeting the first week of May to have the testing reports completed and available for you uh, with the expectation that action could be taken by the commissioners at a May meeting. Uh, with regard to uh, Westchester County, uh, the operations unit had received an inquiry regarding a potential issue where certain districts in Westchester County were reporting an unusually high number of blank and void votes for the 2020 general election. Uh, the operations unit did reach out to the Westchester board and get a try to get a better understanding of what may have caused such an issue. Uh, we did receive a response back from the Westchester board on March 19th, which did proper an explanation. Uh, however, in the opinion of the unit, it does not appear to fully explain the anomaly. Uh, as such, the, the operations unit will be arranging for a bipartisan meeting between state and county staff to review the issue in a more comprehensive manner, and we'll, we'll report back to the commissioners at the next meeting. Um, one other thing that I know Commissioner Kelder had asked me to cover uh, there was an issue with regard to uh, hash checking uh, that was first raised by the Texas Secretary of State back in September of 2020 and then later documented uh, further by the EAC a month later and again online in an article on the Freedom to Tinker blog at the beginning of March. Uh, the issue affected the Expresso BMD and focused on the hash checking procedure for which the purpose is to verify that the software installed on the voting machine is indeed the certified version. Um, that article focused on three main points, uh, that the supplied hash code checker could erroneously report a match. Uh, in, in the article, they talked about how if the, uh, the file containing the hash codes was actually left out, the hash code checker would still um, report a pass. 
Um, it also uh, said that the, the, the hash code checker checked the hashes uh, against uh, those values uh, on the application that was first installed and not against what's called the golden hash or the authorized reference that they're supposed to. And, and the last issue that they really raised in that report was that the vendors themselves were performing the hash check on the machine. Now, despite the fact that the Express Web BMD is not presently certified for use in New York, uh, there are also a number of reasons why the concerns raised would be mitigated here. Uh, first, we have historically not relied on any vendor supplied hash checking procedure, opting instead to create our own for each voting system, uh, which uses independent hardware and software to compare the hash check. In the case of the of ESNS systems, uh, the state actually created a software script which performs that hash check and returns an error in the Texas scenario so that if there is a, a file that's left out, it does not give a pass. It actually will report that there is an error. Uh, secondly, the authoritative hashes that are used in this process are supplied by the state and are hard-coded into that script, so they actually can't be forgotten. Um, and the, as the counties are, can only use the software uh, that comes from the state board, and those hashes do come from the trusted build uh, that was part of the certified application. And then lastly, as I actually mentioned earlier in my unit report, uh, acceptance testing of all new machines is done with the direct involvement and supervision of state board staff without any vendor involvement. Uh, that being said, I think that pretty much covers it for my unit report, unless Brendan, you wanted to add anything? No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That's a, a very thorough report. Uh, and um, shows that we're uh, paying careful attention to these uh, election integrity issues. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, so we'll move uh, to uh, public information, John Conklin and Cheryl Kowser. Sorry about that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Public Information Office has been uh, busy since the last meeting. Uh, we've answered lots of questions about independent petitions and changes that have been made, uh, contribution limits, changes to party enrollment, uh, the January periodic report that was filed, um, and the campaign finance public disclosure reporting page as well, among other things. Um, the unit processed 171 FOIL requests in March. Uh, we've also continued uh, with uh, working group meetings for automatic and online voter registration. Uh, in addition, uh, we've met with IT and compliance on upgrades to the public reporting uh, site uh, that have been pushed out. Um, we also, as a uh, IT and compliance as a group, met with uh, uh, a group of individuals from uh, reInvent Albany. Um, and also from uh, the New York Press Service. Uh, I think those went reasonably well. Uh, we got good feedback from them. Uh, we were also able to explain a number of things about the public reporting page. Um, so, but we continue to, to work on, on those issues. Um, we uh, participated in the monthly ECA call with the counties. Um, and we're about to reissue the annual SANS uh, cyber hygiene, cybersecurity training module for all county boards and state board personnel and some county IT staff as well. For the website, we posted uh, the 2021 contribution limits, uh, also the campaign finance filing calendar for 2021. Uh, we did additional updates to the 2021 political calendar for independent petitions and signatures. Um, and posted the filings that were received, as Tom mentioned, for the June 22nd primary here at the State Board. And we also posted the webcast from the March 15th uh, PCFB and SBOE uh, board meetings. Uh, for the National Voter Registration Act, we continued to do virtual NICE voter board reviews. Uh, we did uh, reviews with Cattaraugus, Chemung, Monroe, St. Lawrence, Rockland, Shenango, and Madison County since the last board meeting, and we had done Franklin before the last board meeting. Uh, all were found to be compliant, so we continue to move ahead with, with those. Um, 
for grants, I'm going to let Cheryl do a little update on grants uh, so she can discuss what came out of the budget and where we are with the other grants that uh, PIO is is taking care of. Cheryl. Great, thank you. Uh, with the enactment of the state fiscal year 21 22 budget, um, they had the inclusion of two new grant programs, which Bob and Todd both discussed. There's the $25 million capital technology fund to make improvements in election infrastructure. $20 million is allocated to for grants for county boards of elections and $5 million to the state. Um, and we are working on the plan and will uh, develop contracts uh, in the next couple of days and weeks um, to get out to the county boards and for your approval. Uh, there is a $2 million aid to localities early voting expansion grant. Uh, and it, there's a similar process around that grant as well. That brings the public information office to administering nine grant programs. Um, two grant programs were reappropriated in the state budget. Uh, the reappropriations were for the aid to localities early voting grant fund and the capital e pool book grant program. Both relatively have approximately um, uh, about $500,000 in those funds. Uh, contract amendments and cover letters are drafted and will be sent out, uh, reviewed and sent out to the counties for those programs. Uh, we participated in the Election uh, Assistance Commission semi-annual report webinar. Um, the semi-annual reports are due on April 30th. Uh, the financial statement is are being prepared by the Office of General Services, and we are drafting narratives. Um, and we'll have those submitted earlier than the deadline. Um, the HAVA CARES funding for the 2020 election uh, is closing out. Uh, we're at the point now that we will notify the Election Assistance Commission of our intent um, to close out that funding. We have to coordinate that with the Division of Budget and the Office of General Services because when we notify the intent, we would make a filing on June 30th and we have 90 days to close it to refund the money or interest. Um, to that end, we have to make a couple certifications and one is to certify what equipment individually that is left over exceeding $5,000. So the county boards have been uh, providing us with that documentation. Very little is coming back that the county has leftover um, unused items in an aggregated form of more than $5,000. Uh, likewise, we have an inventory of any equipment purchase over $5,000 that will be maintained for that public cares grant. Um, we have roughly $718,000 to refund for that grant. Um, we reached out to all the county boards that did not fully submit a cybersecurity contract. Uh, we have 10 counties left. Many are going through the legislative process and approximately of those 10, one, two, eight have submitted contracts, but they were missing appendices and we sent those back to have those completed and returned. So we will continue working with them to get fully completed contracts and have that squared away. The contract expires this December. Um, Cheryl, you, you seem to have muted in the last 30 seconds. I think I was just cut off. I'm sorry. So have you finished your report? I did. Uh, for some reason, I must have been muted midstream. So I apologize. I don't know how that happened. Um, well, so what was the last report? I will continue from there. No, uh, I, 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 I think you were literally on the last sentence when it went off. Okay. Well, right. I ended with the cybersecurity contract. There are 10 outstanding. Right. We reached all the counties, eight of which they submitted some part of the contract, not a full contract. So we're following up for those appendices. And that is all that I have. Right. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, then we'll uh, turn to uh, 
uh, our technical um, director, William Cross. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, I'll start with projects. Uh, for Capus Fidus, uh, we continue to make numerous updates and improvements to the system uh, during our weekly releases, uh, and we've also published a list of those updates to the site under a section called Release Notes uh, to inform the users of, of what changes have been made over the past week. Uh, most of these improvements have largely been fed by uh, internal and external stakeholders, uh, including the uh, outreach sessions to groups, as, as John mentioned, uh, the reInvent Albany and the New York Press Service. We've also solicited, uh, actively solicited input from uh, treasurers and filers and the mailing that was done to them to, to ready for filing uh, to, to ask for feedback as well. Uh, in general, we continue to work uh, towards making the initial uh, and addressing largely most of the concerns of, of the comments was making initial uh, search uh, results broader and then providing the user the greater ability to filter from there uh, more along the lines of, of the referenced uh, New York City Board uh, CFB site. Um, so we, work, we are working towards that end. Um, we've already made several of the previously required fields uh, now optional to help streamline the, those searches, and I think our, our feedback from the groups uh, has been positive so far with, on that. We also, also have worked extensively uh, with the... Bill, could I just interrupt for a second and say that the feedback has been that that particular change has been positive. But okay. it's my view that the feedback has been universally negative on the system and that there is still very substantial dissatisfaction among the user community. All right, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I didn't want to let that pass um, no. with no. the suggestion that that one improvement has uh, satiated the uh, user community. No, Commissioner, I didn't mean to apply that. I, th I think, as I, as I pointed out, we recognize there's still work to be done, in particular making making the search, as I said, indicating, making the search easier to use and, and providing broader results. Um, there is still work to be done there, and that is on our timeline. Um, I'm sorry if I, I implied that. It was not meant to be. Um, we also worked extensively with the Chief Data Officers uh, group with, for the state, New York State Chief Data Officer, um, to publish the filer data uh, to the OpenNY uh, platform. Uh, that those data sets went live on Monday, uh, August, uh, April 12th, I believe, uh, and are now being published daily. Uh, that was one of the large requests that we had too, is to make the larger data sets available for uh, analysis to, for those groups. Uh, for online voter registration and automatic registration, uh, as I reported last month, the Office of General Services uh, indicated that our bid for the OVR and AVR had to be reissued, uh, in particular as a full RFP. Um, as such, we've gone through and we fully revised the document uh, into an, a, a, a complete RFP format as opposed to a mini bid, as they had indicated uh, previously. Uh, that has now been put, provided back to OGS uh, and is under their review. Um, we are meeting with them, I believe, tomorrow for, for their comments. Uh, we expect right now the revised RFP to be issued by the end of May with, respons with responses due in July. Um, that, of course, is, is subject to, with a full RFP, additional approvals by the AG's office and OSC. Uh, we can't. We can't really anticipate their timeline, um, but we are hopeful uh, for positive feedback there. Um, for NICE Voter, we continue to work on several enhancements for that system, uh, including adding uh, local ballot information, and we have implemented uh, for the counties the ability to directly upload uh, and update their uh, list of uh, poll sites, uh, both election day and early poll sites. We've also made the absentee ballot request portal uh, 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 re was re-implemented on the uh, March 25th. Um, the primary change for that was the, the addition of or the selection of uh, uh, 
desired uh, elections uh, to be applicable, a special primary general or a date range. Um, that, that update also included the uh, accessible uh, absentee ballot uh, request. Uh, for security, uh, the proposed uh, cyber regulations as approved by the board last month have been issued for public comment. Uh, those are due by June 1st. Um, uh, we continue to work with operations, as Tom indicated, on, on development of the voter registration standards uh, for voter registration systems, uh, both new and existing. And as well, the secure election staff has also worked with operations on testing and scanning the e-poll book systems uh, for that process. Uh, and we also continue to work with SUNY Center for Technology and Government on the uh, future of elections infrastructure project, uh, to, and that is going well. As well, we continue to work with NYSTEC in various counties on implementation of their remediate, cybersecurity remediation plans, uh, providing guidance and input on the, that process and to help them along, uh, as well as working with PIO to review and uh, approve numerous reimbursements on the associated grant on those, on those plans. Uh, and always, we continue to make security improvements to our own infrastructure uh, here. Um, for our website, uh, I think as to be expected, post-election levels are still around uh, about 170,000 uh, views per month. They typically in that range uh, during non-election periods, 170,000 to 200,000. Um, so that's my report. Is there any questions? All right, well, there being no questions, uh, we move to the next item on our list, which is enforcement and uh, the uh, position of uh, enforcement council uh, remains vacant. I have not uh, received any responses to my communications with the governor's office about filling that vacancy. Um, uh, Bob Bram or Todd Valentine, have you got any news from the governor's office on whether they're in the process of appointing? You know, Todd and I have a, a, a bi-weekly call with the governor's office. It comes up usually during that call. Uh, two, two questions we always ask in addition to can we fill jobs and space is uh, where's our seventh commissioner? for public finance and, and is there any movement on appointing an enforcement council? There, there has been no comment with regard to enforcement council. Um, at our call this past Monday, uh, we were told that they at least have, um, uh, you know, the possibility of, of a separate coming. Uh, you know, but some news, um, the staff that are here, even though they've admitted they don't have the authority to do certain things, um, they do, you know, Todd and I um, have a, uh, we've had an open uh, appointment for every other week for enforcement. Risa had refused to come to the appointment, but uh, we continue, you know, Carla and staff join the call. We don't make great progress, but we talk about more of the nuts and bolts of how to keep the agency aligned, um, protect projects. Um, so I thought that was positive. Hopefully that'll continue. I mean, because it's keep the lights on kind of stuff, there's nothing earth shattering to share, but, but I just thought the fact that it was happening is That's in itself a positive direction. I the short answer to your, to your question, Commissioner, was no, they haven't, they, they haven't mentioned anything with that. Right, so there is no enforcement because the law says that that office is the sole person who can do enforcement. Uh, uh, all right, uh, unless uh, Anyone wants to uh, discuss the reports? Uh, the next item on our agenda is old business, but I don't believe we have any old business. So we'll take up new business and the um, first item for new business are the ballot access rulings. Um, 
Brian, do you want to just uh, explain, or or what, Tom? I don't know which one of you, uh, but just uh, uh, introduce what it is that you're asking the commissioners to do. Sorry, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, yes, obviously, uh, as we normally do whenever we have ballot access, uh, any kind of prima facie rulings uh, we put together uh, for your review and uh, possible approval. Uh, this one is pretty short and sweet. Uh, we had one petition that was filed late, and so therefore uh, it should be deemed invalid, and that was for uh, a set of dele delegate and alternate delegates for the third judicial district in the 101st assembly district on the conservative party line. Is that the only one you want to do? That's the That's it. Okay. So, uh, is there a motion to adopt the report? Um, Peter, we don't hear you, but I can see you making the motion. Second. Apologize. I move that we adopt. How's that? Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose. All right. That uh, is adopted. No, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Can I go back for just a minute? I apologize. I was Certainly. on mute. But uh, back under old business for just a second, and this goes back to something that we referenced in, uh, in the minutes from the last meeting uh, <laughs> that I brought up actually early in this early in this meeting. There was a uh, in the discussion on that what, what was called in the minutes the high density early voting sites. There was a reference in that uh, section of our minutes that senior staff was looking at drafts. Uh, for regulations on that topic that they were going to bring to us at this meeting. And I don't see any regulations to us here at this meeting. And I, I just wonder what, those, what, what is the status of that particular um, law and enforcement of the law and how that's, how that's working and, and, and whether regulations are actually in, in, in the mix here. If you give me a moment, Commissioner. Um, sure. There's the legislature put a bill in to address this issue since our last meeting. Um, they hadn't considered it yet, but at least they've introduced it. Um, I don't have the bill number, but I will get it to you. Um, but generally, we were trying to deal with, um, in a primary, if, if the largest political subdivision didn't have a contest, um, how do we read that language? And we either proposed, or we discussed last time, should we consider a regulation, maybe a bill? Um, we talked about it, and in the meantime, the legislature put a bill in, and I believe it's in both houses. So um, I'll get you the number, and at this point, you should probably monitor that bill. Okay. Thank you. All right, then uh, the next item on the agenda was uh, resolution 21-09 for uh, the appointment of hearing officers. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Second, please. Second. All right. Uh, does anyone want to discuss the resolution? All right, in that case, I'll call for a vote. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, so the resolution is adopted unanimously. Uh, the next item on our agenda is resolution 21-07, uh, the upgrade to e poll book certifications. Um, um, I guess I'll ask for uh, a motion and a second, and then I'll ask for uh, Brian or Brendan to, I mean, uh, Tom or Brendan to give a short report. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. And a second? I'll second. All right. Uh, Tom or Brendan, do you want to just uh, explain the resolution? Uh, sure. The resolution uh, is looking to approve. Uh, configurations by all three e-poll book vendors. 
Uh, a number of them, actually all three of them, have submit changes to their application and also to the configuration as far as the underly, underlying uh, operating system for uh, Robus, that's the Windows operating system, and for 10X and NOE, that is the, the newer version of the iOS operating system. Um, as Bill mentioned before, with the help of some of the staff from the Secure Election Center, uh, we did do uh, some vulnerability scanning and testing uh, that we tend to do whenever we receive a, a new version of the system. Uh, we reviewed any of the, the changes, uh, the technical data package, and we provided you all with copies of those uh, reports. And it is the recommendation of the unit that these configurations be approved. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or further discussion? So I'll call for a vote. Uh, those in favor of the resolution say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? None. Uh, so the resolution <laughs> is adopted unanimously. Uh, the next item on our agenda is resolution 2108, which is uh, for the adoption of uh, part uh, 6210 uh section 21 of the absentee ballot envelope cures uh, regulations um brian you want to just to uh, explain what stage we're at with this sure um so the um last year the um uh, the legislature adopted uh chapter 141 um, of the laws of, uh, of 2020 providing for a cures process and the board um, promulgated um, a process uh, that would be um, that would be followed and that largely has followed through to, to this iteration um, in January um, just to just to fill in a few of the other interest issues um, from then to now January um, the board um, put this out for public comment um, and uh, the, the public comment period has, has now closed um, and so it's ripe for adoption. The board also adopted these on a uh, emergency basis at that time. Um, so they're in effect presently um, and the uh, emergency adoption, I believe, is good until the 26th of this month. So these are now in a very modestly revised version, mostly um, uh, ministerial changes like conforming the numbering, um, uh, process to, to that which um, uh, is uh, uh, provided for um, by the rules regulatory unit um, at uh, the Department of State um, and uh, a few other sentence corrections. But uh, yeah, but otherwise, this um, this regulation is uh, fundamentally the same as the emergency regulation that was adopted, and fundamentally the same as the uh, process that was implemented uh, last year. Okay, and um, uh, this uh, will be the final adoption of these regulations, is that correct? Yes. Uh, is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. All right, uh, any further discussion? Yes, I have a question. On uh, uh, I guess it's subdivision H, paragraph one. There is a reference. Uh, it's 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 the uh, entitled paragraph or entitled section: signature comparison standards, procedure, and training. Uh, paragraph one says: Prior to any staff person being assigned to do signature reviews, they should be trained and prepared for such tasks in accordance with guidance developed by the State Board of Elections. Um, I, I guess my question is about that guidance. Is there? Is there uh, guidance that's been approved here for the local boards to utilize for doing signature matches? Is there is there training and understanding of the of the of the status of that particular um, task? Sure. Sorry, my um, I just uh, there's some. I just don't, I, I'm just trying to understand the status of that particular requirement. Right. So la last year, um, when we, when we had the, the same requirement, um, the, uh, the council's unit um, provided a, um, uh, a WebEx meeting with um, uh, 
county boards to, to go over um, that process. And in the translation of the, of the regulation into um, oper you know, operational uh, status, uh, we did provide a document um, to them. And then we went over the, um, the concept of signature matching. Um, as part of that, we, um, we have borrowed heavily from New Jersey and I think Colorado. Uh, but there, but there is a document, and um, and there was previously um, uh, instruction to the county boards provided. So that's so, something we've already done. And are the are the local boards undertaking? I mean, is there a standardized process then around the state for how staff is to analyze signature matches? I, well, I, certainly the extent of standardization, um, you know, I don't, they're not all using the exact same form, for example, um, but the, the process of the regulation itself and the document that we provided was to accomplish um, exactly the sentiment that you just provided. Um, one of the things that, um, that became clear to the counties is that when they have such a large number of ballots um, that signature matching is required for, which happened last year, um, that they had to, um, and, and, and then when they had to act as a result of uh, finding a mismatch, um, they did have to largely standardize their process. The cure process itself requires that because you have to actually complete the document that would go to the voter if you find a mismatch. Um, and then um, and then ensuring that a larger number of board staff perhaps than before uh, would be doing that because when when you didn't look at those envelopes until the time of the canvas and it would be typically the commissioners that were sitting there at the time of the canvas it was a it was a different paradigm so the boards had to adapt both for signature review and other reviews to using the um, form of affidavit um, uh, to be filled out and sent to the to the voters when there was a mismatch or other problem with the ballot and to get that work done um, in a timely manner after uh, the ballot was actually received. So there were a lot of procedural elements um, that perhaps were not there before um, uh, did evolve as part of the process. In terms of um, the matching criteria, and, and this was enlightened by uh, litigation in other states um, as well, it was important to, um, uh, to have people understand that you were looking for signature consistency, not necessarily signature perfection. Um, you were looking to um, also, uh, when you had a fundamental concern about a signature and you had other exemplar signatures available to you, the board typically will have many signature exemplars, particularly for voters in the absentee realm, because um, they often are not first time flyers with absentee, you know, um, that they would go back and look at other exemplars. And that's drawn out in, I think, subdivision two of, um, of section H. Um, so um, so it, it does continue to be a work in progress. I know from the annual statistical report uh, that there were not an insignificant number of ballots that were in fact rejected, I don't recall the exact number, but were in fact rejected for signatures that did not match. Um, so the so reviews, solid evidence that the review of signatures is happening um, and that the boards are, are taking it seriously. Does this same process go on for uh, poll workers? Um, poll workers on, on election day? Right. Or yeah. on early voting. Uh, or early voting. Yeah. Any, you know, any other, any other besides paper ballots? Yeah, it, it does go on, but it is somewhat different, obviously, because the voter is actually right there in front of the poll worker. And then if the poll worker, um, you know, thinks that the that the signature does not match, they have the ability to subject the person who's in front of them to an oath process. Um, but the electronic poll books do provide for um, the signature being captured and then um, and then compared um, by the by the poll. I guess my question, Brian, is: Is the same training going on with the poll workers that's going on with those counting at the central count? It's not necessary. It's not being done at the same time, um, but the standard should be the same. Um, and um, if, if that is the, the point that you're making, but I don't actually know precisely on a county by county basis, um, you know, um, how they've amended their curricula for their poll. 
Okay. I mean, maybe this is an issue for, uh, you know, Tom and Brendan, but I think that, you know, going forward as we're sending out these guidances to our counties and attempting to standardize the way that they are administering elections that, you know, you know looking at the county boards as you do and seeing how they are implementing these kind of standards is important. I think to me, certainly, that they are taking this guidance and, and, and working with it. I realize these are not mandates. As far as I know, there's nothing that mandates them to use our particular standards, but it does seem important to me that we have some sort of statewide standards that are being used universally around the state uh, for purposes of signature matches as well as other purposes. But uh, if we do have guidance, I, I think it'd be helpful to know how the counties are implementing it, how their training is, you know, who does the training, how the training is going, and whether or not this is uh, bearing fruit. Anything else? Are we ready then to uh, vote on the resolution? Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So, uh, Resolution 21-08 is adopted. Um, and um, the next item is uh, approval or discussion and approval of the uh, legislative packet for 2021. Um, I, I have some issues or something to talk about. It seems to me that we have a couple of problems that we constantly bring up and that may be helped out legislatively if we approach them creatively. Uh, we have uh, the problem with the uh, our council not uh, following up on non-filers. And I think that if we could figure out some way of handling that legislatively, it might be helpful. Um, the and I, I really don't know how to do that. I mean, maybe Brian is going to put the heads together and do that, but we should fix it somehow. And uh, with a definitive uh, mandate of what has to be done, or taking it back and only handing over whatever. But um, you can't leave it this way. You can't keep reporting that X number of thousand non-filers haven't been followed up on. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, we have an opportunity now without a council before they are appointed, and we should we should do something about it. Um, the other thing I was uh, looking at was that within that structure, when uh, when the council was reporting, um, we were always told that there were it was old, it was dead, they're not here, they're not there. I think we should consider a moratorium on non-filers over a certain number of years and just get rid of them if that's the case, so there are no more excuses. And then we put in some definitive thing that makes it um, impossible not to follow up on them. Uh, the other thing I'm talking about, I wanted to talk about was we have a problem in getting appointments on time for a personnel that we have. Uniquely, we have the uh, opportunity to appoint our own people. But of course, it gets stuck in the morass of the bureaucracy as it goes through civil service and so on. I think that if we had a legislative mandate within the, within the scope of our legislation, within the scope of our regulations, that gave them a 30 day limit on appointments where they could, uh, we'd, make, we'd make the designation and they had 30 days to finish what they had to do. So we'd get all our positions in within 30 days. And I think that that might be helpful. I, I don't, uh, I don't know how fast or what, what kind of verbiage and where, what legislative situation we could put it in, but I think that that's something that we should be discussing. <clears throat> Um, there, I have comments on both of those issues, um, um, but if uh, Commissioner Kosinski or Commissioner Cassell wants to um, go first, that's fine. Um, on, on the Enforcement Council, I circulated a draft 
bill um, several years ago um, to uh, remove the provision that gives the Enforcement Council the sole authority to uh, make enforcement decisions and to um, give the uh, commissioners of the State Board of Elections concurrent jurisdiction over that. Um, I have still been advancing that proposal. I uh, uh, gave it to uh, legislators earlier this year, and I understand that there are discussions underway um, between the Senate and the Assembly um, to do just that. Uh, but certainly, uh, I would welcome uh, support from the other commissioners. You uh, know, Doug, Doug, I, I read that, and I thought it, I thought it was good, but I just I don't know, I have, a, I have a feeling in terms of any kind of experience I have where you have a bifurcated responsibility like that, that things get in the way, that the responsibility has to be with us or it has to be with them. That's that's my feeling um, in, in terms of whatever it is. Um, but I, I do think that we have an opportunity now with the vacancy and a legislative session, if we're reasonable, and I think what we're talking about is reasonable here, we got proof that we have a problem that we should try to figure out some something within the scope of either what you presented or what we could come up and think about. And I, I think on the other hand, on that 30 day or whatever day, but we, we need our people, not that everyone does, and I know that every department has the same thing, but we have a unique aspect of having to be able to do things by specific dates in a specific year. And we have to have our people there and ready to do this. It's the most important thing you can do is vote. Commissioner, I have no objection if you want to ask uh, staff to draft uh, such a proposal. However, um, again, I have gone on record many times over the years to say that uh, uh, that I believe that we already have more than that authority, that the uh, budget office does not have authority under Governor Spitzer's uh, 2008 emergency memo to uh, prevent uh, the commissioners of the State Board of Elections from adding staff that are um, uh, properly budgeted um, and uh, um, and that uh, uh, it is not legal for the division of the budget to prevent us um, from hiring staff once we've made those decisions. And uh, I, I understand my colleagues' reluctance to actually lance the boil and litigate that issue. Um, it was done in Erie County and the commissioners were successful uh, under the comparable statute for county commissioners. And um, I just want to say on the record that while I don't mind that uh, somebody draft up legislation to clarify this, that I think that uh, um, it is illegal for the division of the budget to hold up paying people that we have determined to hire into uh, positions where there is an appropriation for those positions. Well, you know, I, I, I always try to avoid litigation when I can. Um, and I don't wanna win the battle and lose the war. Um, th this, this just seems like simple and reasonable and always leaves you the option of doing the other. And, um, you know, whenever I've gone into court, the judge always asks me, what did you do to make this go away before you came here? And I think that um, this is one of those things you can do. You know, it's, it's a legislative session. It's a simple ask. We already have the power to do what you said. And what we want to do is make sure everyone understands we're being reasonable. There is some ministerial stuff that has to get done whenever you appoint someone. You know, they have to get sometimes background checks. They have to get uh, all kinds of uh, medical things down. They have to get their dates. So there's paperwork to do. Good. 30 days is a reasonable time. 
in, in order to do that. And um, so, so we're not giving up anything. What we're doing is we're being reasonable. Again, yeah. yeah I, I, have, I have a couple of comments on both topics. Um, you know, on the on the on the staffing issue, I certainly would <clears throat> welcome the opportunity or the ability of this board to be able to appoint our own people and not have to run things through the second floor or through civil service or whoever else has to be. Uh, you know, run through to get approval so that we have more authority over our own destiny. I just don't know that that's realistic. Um, I realize, you know, Commissioner Kelly, you're talking about what the counties can do, and I agree with you. And we've had, I've had many discussions with county boards about this who are frustrated as well. And there is authority within the law that they have the ability to appoint people uh, once they're approved. My caution to those counties had always been you can appoint them this year, and I think you can. You know that legally you'll have that authority, but you know be aware that if you uh, go back into the, your county executive for a budget next year, they will probably remember that you've countermanded them and done whatever you felt like doing. And I think we run that same risk that if we decide to go ahead and appoint people that the governor uh, has has determined you know he doesn't want us to, that we run the risk of next year's budget not being quite so kind to us. So. I'm certainly willing to pursue that because I think it is important to have our own destiny in our own hands, but I would just caution that there are potentially downfalls with that particular idea. Um, on the second topic on the enforcement council issue, I, I, I certainly concur that I believe uh, it's important for us to have a role in the enforcement of the election law. And I would certainly um, welcome our authority to enforce the election law, not just in the context of failures to file, but in all contexts. Um, you know, the concern I have going forward, and, and I've had it, is, you know, the Enforcement Council has this authority. We don't anymore. The Enforcement Council is not a bipartisan actor anymore. It's a partisan actor. Uh, you know, it's appointed by the governor. It's now going to be approved by the Assembly and the Senate, both controlled by the Democrats. Uh, this is nothing against my Democratic colleagues, but the reality is that this enforcement council position is now totally controlled by one party. And, you know, the nature of elections is bipartisanship is the watchword. And unfortunately, we no longer have that in the enforcement unit. So, uh, you know, the appointment of this new person will be controlled by one party, whoever this person is, and uh, will be beholden to one party. I think that's a very dangerous precedent to have in the elections arena. I would welcome something that takes back the authority of enforcement of the elections and puts it in a bipartisan agency like us, the State Board of Elections, so that we ensure bipartisan enforcement of our election laws. And we don't run the risk of having one party control the enforcement, which I think is unfortunately where we are now. You know, back when uh, our first enforcement council was appointed, there was, at least in one house, there was, you know, there was bipartisanship, one house controlled by the Democrats, one house controlled by the Republicans. Now both houses controlled by the same party, along with the along with the governor. So I, I just I, I think it's a bigger issue, frankly, than just us taking back some authority in the arena of enforcement of failures to file. I think there's a bigger issue at play. I would I would welcome a discussion about that, and if we wanted to pursue something that way. But again, bipartisanship I think is the watchword. I welcome that in the you know I think. Uh, uh, Commissioner Yanka has definitely set a good tone for the new um, uh, public campaign finance board, but we also know that's got the same issue. There's, it's a four to three split. Uh, one party controls in, in, in the sense that they have a dominant number. And I just see a trend here where in the elections arena, more and more of the new entities that are being created to govern over elections operations are being done in a more partisan way. And I think that's unfortunate. I think it's better to have bipartisan uh, enforcement of our laws, bipartisan administration of our laws, and I would welcome that discussion. Well, I, I think that uh, you know this, this is uh, the problem right now is an accident of the elections. I, I think that uh, I, I agree with you, by the way. So you know, I just want to say that up front. But you know, if you want to go, if if you want to go in also and look at the uh, enforcement council uh, legislation. And add to it the majority leader of the the minority leader of the Senate. If 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 the both houses have 
uh, one party, I'm totally in favor of that. I don't have a problem with that. I agree with you. And after what went on in these elections, not only in New York State, but throughout this country, I think the people would agree with you. Well, I, I think the biggest problem, the bigger problem is um, the, the language that gives Enforcement Council the sole authority. So you've made a czar who um, is not accountable to anyone once they've been appointed and uh, that that's just no way to govern, especially uh, in an environment where there should be bipartisan uh, and uniform uh, administration of the election rules. Well, I think that well, given, given, given the, the fact that uh, the election commission, the, 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 the uh, enforcement council was was supposed to replace a previous uh, situation, uh, certainly not in total, uh, and that was supposed to be a, non, a bipartisan or nonpartisan group. Uh, I, I think there's a, a, a rationale for looking looking at this and saying that that position ought to be bipartisan. Uh, you know, I I, I I have a real problem with that. I don't mind arguing with these guys. But I disagree with them. Sometimes they're right, very, very short periods of time, but sometimes they're right. And I, and I want to, you know, I want to get, the, I, want, I want everyone to feel comfortable with this. I want myself to feel comfortable with this. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable with this at all. It's like putting a, you know, a city manager in where he only has to be responsible for four out of seven guys, you know? And everyone thinks that's great. And meanwhile, he has to satisfy or she has to satisfy four people. This is not this is not appropriate for an election commission. Well, Actually, so all these are reasonable. If you look at them, there's nothing. There's nothing. No one's looking to get a get a, a Benny out of this. Well, so far we haven't discussed any of the bills, the uh, bills that are actually on the packet that we're proposing, and um, I don't know that there's text for either of the. Uh, uh, independent I, council or the um, uh, hiring uh, board personnel issues. Um, so, uh, is there any discussion of the uh, 19 items that are? Yeah, Doug, Doug, Doug. I'd like to ask. The, I'd like to ask a question about the last item dealing with the terms of commissioners. Does anyone know where that came from and what it's intended to do? Yes, um, this is Brian. Um, that um, that item um, has been out there for for a while. It's on the uh, legislative program of the Election Commissioners Association, and the uh, the rationale is that um, the the work of an election commissioner has become increasingly um, technical and complicated, and that in order to um, maintain a uh, uh, a, a core of election officials that um, know what they need to know, um, that them having the certainty of a uh, four-year term uh, would be helpful um, for consistency and quality. What is the current situation, Brian? Are they are they all two-year terms or are some two and some are four? Some, some are two and some are four. The statute provides for a few counties that are specified to be four right in the state law. The default is two and county legislatures um, can increase the term um, to four if they, uh, if they so choose. But, but currently it's the local governing body that sets the term, correct? The, the, it's the local governing body that can, in most counties, it's the local governing body that can set the term um, at four instead of two. Um, and um, except for in a few counties that are actually designated in the statute to have four-year terms. I don't know why we'd want to take away uh, the jurisdiction of the local, of the uh, county government. It's not really a, it's not really another mandate, but it's telling them how to run county government. I think I think it's best left to the locals to decide what's best for, for their community. Um, 
I'd like to suggest we just drop that one off our list. If they want to leave it on their list and present it, fine, but uh, nothing, it's not something I could support at state board level. I'm fine with that. I don't mind dropping it. No, I'm fine. I don't think anybody should have a two year term. Well, that's the issue. Two or four. Oh, no, I mean, I, I mean, anybody in any 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 job should have a two year term. No, I mean, two year terms were set up at a different time. It's, it's you know, if you start, these are not elected officials. So, well, I mean, no, they're not elected officials. But, but even elected officials, you got to start fundraising the minute you get in office. <laughs> Yeah, it might be hard to convince the assembly and Senate that the two year term is appropriate for them, but not appropriate for a county board. Well, I, I understand that. I understand that. Right. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm fine with Commissioner Cassell's request, and we can just drop that, um, leave that to a local decision. Okay. That's okay. Buddy. Okay. I, I, agree. I did have a question about the first one myself, um, the health related ex exigency. Uh, Bill, I'm just not clear how that's administered and, you know, how does, how does that work and, 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 and what is the issue that that is intending? I, I haven't seen the text of the bill, to be honest, so I'm just looking off the uh, description here on my list, but if someone could just describe me a little bit how that would work and what that's addressing, the situation that's addressing. Right. Um, th this is also um, an item that comes off of the Election Commissioners Association um, uh, list of program uh, uh, bills. And what it deals with is the situation that, that many boards of elections have found themselves in uh, where you have someone um, on election day, um, for example, uh, in the morning on election day, ends up going into the hospital um, and uh, therefore unable to attend at the polls and they uh, they call or uh, someone for them calls and this person is deeply committed to voting but is in this exigent situation where they they can't vote and um, there I think all boards of elections have uh, certainly I as a, a county commissioner have experienced this um, it seems like once every election this, this kind of situation arises and it's the one day um, that you have no options for that voter um you know if, if they can't attend to the polls i mean and any other day um even including the day before someone can come down with an application et cetera, et cetera, and you can you can accommodate somebody so this this is this is meant to be extremely limited because it's not designed to um, be a, oh i forgot um so i'm just going to use this tool on election day um and indeed there's very little incentive for that because the voter has the ability to attend if they can um, you know, at, at, at their, their regular poll site. Um, but for the voter that um, finds themselves in extremis and can't, um, this would, would let, give a tool to local um, boards to be able to issue an absentee, or in this case, a, essentially a special ballot um, for health-related exigencies. And it, it is on the ECA uh, legislative program. You know, Brian, maybe you could just explain to me the process. So I'm... Uh in this situation so what I, I i have an emergency i have to go to the hospital and i want to vote so there's a we're calling it a special ballot now not an absentee ballot i guess that's to get around the absentee ballot requirements um what do i have to do to enable to cast a ballot that day so as with um any um special ballot or absentee ballot there would be an application um and so someone would have to um obtain that application um, the voter would have to complete it and they would have to come back to the board and then a ballot could be given to um, to, the, to the agent of the person um, and um, and then deliver it back um, uh, to the voter and then the voter would be required to um, get it back to the board that day or get it um, or get it into the mail stream and post office. So we have a, as I understand it right now, we have a list of uh, of uh, people that would qualify for this, this like election day workers. Um, I believe you have rigid, religious scruples that prevent you from going to your poll site on, on, on election day, you would qualify. Am I, am I correct here? There's a couple different 
Victims of domestic violence. Victims of domestic violence. So there's a few uh, uh, more categories that people, of, of people. This would add a, a fourth category. Is that is that an exhaustive list? And this would just add a fourth category of people that would qualify for this kind of ballot. It would it would add an additional um, category. Each of mm -hmm. those different categories, um, there there are slightly different rules associated with them, um, and and, I, and this would be. Um, and this would be the same, but yes, functionally, that's exactly what it does. Okay, and you have to swear that you have what some sort of medical emergency that requires you to uh, apply for this ballot. Yes, um, as with um, any um, uh, ballot, you have to attest to your having the qualification in order to receive. Is this is so this is a this is health for this is a only a medical emergency though that this would apply to is that is that correct um that is also correct yeah okay okay but but, but we don't define it any any more specifically by, of what actually amounts to a medical emergency it doesn't have to be that i've gone to the hospital or any particular type of activity i would just swear i have a medical emergency and that's it i don't have to say and it required hospital care or some sort of special care or anything like that um it would require an attestation that the health related agency arose um, on or after the day before the election um, and would and prevent the person from attending to the I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that explanation. And this was re this has been requested by the local boards. Is that correct? The county boards have requested that this kind of uh, relief be given to these individuals. That, that is correct. The, um, the bi on a bipartisan and uh, uh, unanimous basis, the Election Commissioners Association um, have, are also seeking the legislature to, to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. If there are no other comments, uh, uh, I'll move that we uh, approve the uh, legislative packet. Is there a second? Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the legislative packet is approved. Um, that uh, exhausts our agenda. I don't believe there's any need for um, an executive session. Should we talk about our uh, meeting date in May? We should. I think while you check your calendar, the question that Commissioner Kaczynski asked earlier about old business, I found the bill. It's the Senate Bill 6215, Assembly 6478, and it would provide uh, some flexibility for the largest jurisdiction uh, assignment. Uh, in cases of a special election, a primary election, um, or runoff primary election, um, if the political subdivision having the contest is not the largest in the county. But you're saying right now that, um, let's just take Albany County, for example. Albany County doesn't have a primary in the city of Albany this year. Biggest jurisdiction. And they'll still have an early voting site under current law in in the county of Albany in in June. Is that a is that a correct reading of the hear current all those words, Commissioner? Um, I think generally we hear from you know areas like uh, Seneca County where they the county uh, site is in a nearby town. It's not the largest political subdivision. If they need to move it to the largest town this year. For the general election, that's one thing. But in the primary, that large town might not have a primary. And we had asked um, when the bill was passed, we discussed it internally, but um, it doesn't say the largest contest, you know, in the primary, it says in, in the county. So if you don't have one in the, in the largest political subdivision and you could put it in a other town, um, is it supposed to be in the largest town in the primary? Um, if, if that 
and it, it's not clear by the statute. So we want this at least provides clarity what, what flexibility, if at all, you have. It doesn't make it a mandate because, as you know, the political subdivision that has the primary, you know, in some counties could put the primary in a very small town and the poll site in that town just might not have the connectivity uh, for nine days of early voting, the security, things like that, the parking, the capacity. So, um, you know, you got to still give some flexibility to the county if there is no site in that town, um, they could they could have it nearby. Um, so I think this bill at least makes clear there is some flexibility in a primary, a special election, you know, where you find out something is called and you have to go move a site, um, you know, to accommodate that. No, okay. So we don't have a regulation right now that we're looking at. Is that is that fair to say? Well, when they put the bell in, we kind of figured that trumps us. Um, <laughs> assuming they consider it and pass it, um, I think that would resolve this issue. Well, it may create other issues, but I guess that would be up to the legislature. Um, you know, we can't fix everything they do. I do think I I do share the concern of whether we even have the ability to make a regulation that really changes the way the legislation is is uh, written. Anyway, so. Uh, I'm okay with it. I just wanted to raise it because it was in our minutes that something would come back to us, and I just uh, thought it was something we should we should point out. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're talking about meeting dates. Can people right. get their calendars? Right. Um, I'm suggesting uh, the 24th or the 25th of May. I think the 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 one pressing issue is that we'll have to do the uh, ranked choice voting software certification. 24th is bad for me, but 25th is okay. Okay, 25th? I, I, I think, yeah, that looks good. All right, 25th. Okay. 25th? Okay. There's one other recommendation that you consider going forward. You will need to meet before August 2nd so that we can approve the wording of the constitutional amendments or, or ballot proposals right now. There are two that are passed and pending. There are three that are in the Judiciary Committee of the Assembly and passed the Senate. So there's a potential for five. Um, so just as, you know, just we, we should pencil in somewhere around July 28th or 29th, since I think August 2nd is a Sunday, and you know, we can't be so later. August 2nd is a Monday. Oh, sorry. Um, Do we need to set that date now? Well, why don't we tentatively say July 28th? July 28th? All right. Oh, sorry. Still got Bob. Yes? Me, Bob, in, in order to expedite this, will we have the wording in advance? When will, when will the wording be completed so we could have something to look at prior to the, uh, the meeting in July? It's always our hope. So we, we on some of this, we need to get the uh, to the Attorney General's office uh, and then the Attorney General prepares a recommendation for you to consider. And that's always a challenge for timing since we don't control it. Um, we're also nudging those three that are held in the Judiciary Committee just to find out when. Earlier, the better that they get adopted so we can not drop it on the attorney general at the last minute. But in the past, we've asked them to get it to us two weeks before you meet. And the, if you set the meeting, then we can at least try and explain to people where what our time frame is. Because if you have it for two weeks to consider, that gives you time to review and, and, and talk to each other. Thank you. Are we tr are we still trying to coordinate our board of elections meetings with the public campaign finance board meetings? Fair question, but <laughs> I don't believe they I don't believe a meeting was set for the campaign finance board before the other two commissioners got off. So I wondered Somebody's if you wanted to reach out to them. Yes. 
you know, right, right now, it makes sense to do it that way. All right. But let's have Bob and Todd contact uh, uh, Commissioners Kolb and uh, Yankow to check on those dates. Um, yeah, you know, if they can do that, if they have a different date, we could talk about it. But I sure, it's yeah, certainly easy for me to court if we can. We'll, we'll, we'll let them know what date you've chosen. We'll let them know what dates you've chosen, and then. You know, if they concur, then we'll we'll get back to you. If they again, if they have different dates, we'll let you know that too. Okay. All right. Well, is there anything else? No. I would move to adjourn. Uh, those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We're adjourned. Thank you all yep. very much.